Welcome to Getaway Day, episode 51. Gautam Rao, Mason Lott here with you to talk about the National League East Division. Um, before we do that, uh, make sure you subscribe and rate and review on your podcasting platforms and YouTube to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Let us know your thoughts in the comments or leave um, a note on Twitter or Facebook at Getaway Day Pod. What's going on, Mason? Not a whole lot. It's Friday night. Uh, the uh, March Madness tournament is on. Purdue is playing right now, and it is not going the way that I would like it to. So don't so, think about that. Just think about podcasting. You know, that takes the priority here. That's that's a good point. I got to get in the game. Yes. All right, I'm here. I'm in the game. Let's do it. All right, let's go. So we're going to start off with the world champion defenders that the Atlanta Braves who have made quite a few moves um from their team uh last year as uh Alex Anthopoulos likes to do uh the big one of course is Freddie Freeman is no longer a Brave uh we talked about that a little bit in in a previous episode but Matt Olson is in so pretty good replacement for Freddie from a production standpoint for sure honestly um, i think it- if if you would, went back in time and knew you were going to lose Freddie Freeman, I don't think there's a better replacement for him than Matt Olson. Absolutely, so. yeah, I would agree. And great uh, defender as well, and coming off a of absolutely breakout season, like he's going to be awesome in this lineup that's filled with a bunch of other players. Uh, some of the other additions that they made uh, were bringing back Eddie Rosario, who they traded for midseason last year. Um, and then Marcelo Zuna is back from his uh, extended absence uh, for his domestic violence uh, involvement last year. Yeah, I can't um, they, necessarily say I'm thrilled with that. But, I mean, from a, a baseball talent standpoint, they will be better. Yes, they will. So. Um. I guess, uh, is this lineup without Freddie Freeman, you add in Matt Olson, then you bring back Rosario. I feel like it's roughly the same, if not better, when they get uh, Ronald Acuna back from his ACL injury. Yeah, so I think looking at this lineup, uh, th- this lineup is essentially the same as the lineup that took the Braves to an 88-73 and 73 record in 2021. The key difference is at the trade deadline last year, they picked up both Jock Peterson and Jorge Soler in addition to Eddie Rosario uh, and Adam Duvall. Um, And they did not bring back either Jock or Soler. So their bench is a little bit more depleted than it was last year. Um, They can't really play the platoons as much. Um, So that's going to be a big hit. Now they do get, Acuna back in I think they're saying early May is when he's going to be back um, in a DH um, role uh, to start so that'll be huge and I I do think that Acuna is I I would say that Acuna is probably offsetting both Jock and Soler and maybe a little bit more in production so overall I would say this lineup is probably about that much better than the uh, 2021 edition of this team once Acuna is back in May. Yeah, and I, I'm just trying to think back to last season. They really struggled through most of the year until like the second half, really, when they made all those additions. Maybe that was because they miss, were missing Acuna for, um, from basically the midpoint in the season. to. Well, they were missing Acuna. They were missing Ozuna. Um, who did they have in their outfield at the beginning the of last year? Outfield was really rough. Yeah, with guys like uh, Guillermo Heredia, um, just like a really mismatch of like random uh, kind of guys that were not ideal for the outfield, and made sense to go out and get all those four outfielders in trades. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. So it looks like, oh, geez. Um, oh, they were using Pache in the early part of the season, Abraham Almonte. Um, right, yeah. 
So, yeah, so they really didn't have replacements for the guys that they had lost at that point in time. So once they hit the deadline, they went out and got some established major league talent. Then they went on a run, and then we saw what they did in the postseason. Um, they, I, they won the World Series based on their pitching, but if they didn't have those bats and Eddie Rosario, Jorge Soler, who was the World Series MVP, um, Jock Peterson with his pearls, Jock Tober, I mean, they wouldn't have won without those guys, but they still won it, I think, based on their pitching in the, in the postseason. Yeah. So well, one other last uh, point on the lineup and the defensive alignment that I'm seeing here is they have Adam Duvall potentially going to be picking up a lot of playing time in center field. Do you think that's going to work out? I I feel like that I've, I've heard that Duvall is pretty good as a defender. Like he's got a great arm and everything, but I'm not sure you want him doing the center field work all the time. Yeah. I personally wouldn't want him in center a lot. Um, I don't really know that they have a better option other than maybe throwing Guillermo Heredia out there a little bit. Yeah. Um, but Heredia is not a guy that you want in the lineup every day. So no. until Acuna is back and you figure out what you're going to do, I mean, he is your best option. Um, I don't think Acuna really solves the issue either because he, he doesn't. He's injury, more of a right, right fielder. Field. Yeah. Yeah. But he's played more center and I would almost argue if he comes back healthy, he might be your best option in center. Now, would you want to move him from a, a comfort standpoint, especially coming right back off this big injury? Uh, probably not. But yeah, I, I would doubt that they would just send him out to center field right away coming off the catastrophic injury. But yeah, but I, I think Anthopolis needs to be in it. He needs to be looking at the trade block for guys who can play center field. Um, or and he just traded one or, away, like the defensive first guy in Pache. So that's true. Um, now, the question that I have for you is Drew Waters is an outfielder, right? Yeah. Can he play center? I think so. Yeah. So he, he could be the guy if, if he's showing enough at AAA early on in the season. Yeah, because did he actually play at AAA last year, or did he only make it to double? Uh, I do not know. He he played 103 games at AAA last year. He he only played at triple. Um, 240, 329, 381 with 70. Oh no, sorry, not 70 home runs. That would be incredible. Um, 11 home runs, 70 runs, uh, 94 WRC plus at AAA. So if he if he can play center. Um, which it looks like he does predominantly play center. He could be your option if you're looking for uh, basically a direct replacement to Christian Pache, a fast defensive first um, kind of light hitting center fielder. Drew Waters is your guy. And I think they've been giving him a shot here in spring. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he's kind of been running with it. Yeah, it's definitely one to watch, I think. Good good call there. Uh, let's move on to pitching. So I think the Braves have top to bottom a really strong pitching staff with their rotation and then their bullpen, of course. So bullpen got a, a bunch of publicity in the playoffs last year because they were just lights out the whole way through. Which this um, is the exact same bullpen that if you listen back to like maybe our first playoffs episode from last year, we were not high on them at all. No, at all. For we sure. hated yeah. this bullpen. And they shut us up real quick, <laughs> along they with really pretty did. much yeah. everyone else. So. Yeah, so they're returning uh, Will Smith, who's not going to be in the closer role anymore, which I'll get to in a second, um, as well as uh, Tyler Matzek, Luke Jackson, A.J. Minter. So those were their uh, horses in the in the playoffs last year. And then now they've added Kenley Jansen, esteemed closer from the Dodgers. It almost feels like uh, getting a revenge on the Dodgers for taking Freddie. Like, we're going to get one of your guys back. Um, and then also Colin McHugh is now a member of the Braves. So with that Kenley move, the Braves have not had a guy, like a guy, since Kimbrell. So this is potentially going to be huge for this team. Like a guy that you're every day, you're like, he's the guy, give it to him. He's going to go out there. He's going to get it done. 
Like they've kind of bounced around some a couple different guys here and there, and we've seen Will Smith get the saves last year, and and Kenley, like he's he's thirty four. He's had uh, he had a down season, if I remember right, two years ago. It's, he's, it, he had a down season, honestly, in like twenty eighteen. And people, well, well, that was that had, was like, my point. Is like playoffs. it was like it was he's a been couple really years good. Ago. Yeah, yeah. Especially last year, he really bounced back. Uh, throwing harder than he had in multiple years, and seems like he's found a second wave to his career now. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it just deepens that bullpen. Also, a guy like McHugh, who is amazing with the Rays last year, he's he can go multiple innings. So the bullpen's like shut down, um, and they've got a strong starting rotation to go along with it. So they've got Max Freed. Uh, Charlie Morton, who's supposed to be completely healthy, uh, coming off the injury that he sustained in the World Series. Ian Anderson's back. Uh, and then just a whole bunch of guys going for the four and five spot. They have a lot of depth with starters. Uh, right now, Anthopolis says that uh, Waskar Enoa and Kyle Wright are the two favorites for the four and five spots in the rotation. They've also got Kyle Muller, Tuki Toussaint, Spencer Strider. Um, who can who will probably make some starts like everyone knows that you can't make it through a season with just five starters you need six seven eight nine ten starters to get through a major league season and then uh the other guy that they've got that it looks like you accidentally put Tuki Toussaint in the notes twice um the other guy that they've got that would be in that competition is a guy that they turned to in the world series last year whenever they lost uh, Charlie Morton in Tucker Davidson so They've got a lot of guys that could potentially come up and crack this rotation. And if someone doesn't pan out, they have more guys to turn to. So that's a great problem to have if you're Alex Anthopoulos and Brian Snicker. I... Yeah, it's no problem at all. Like Just looking at back, back at what happened with the Dodgers and the Padres last year, where they came into the season looking really strong. They even seemed like they had some pitching depth, and then all their pitchers got hurt. and they were rolling out guys that had no business, you know, making starts at that point. Ryan Weathers at like 20 years old. Yeah. Basically. Way before he was ready to be in the majors. Now he did right. solid at the beginning, but yeah, it's, it's hard to put that much uh, pressure and that much expectation on such a young guy. So they're in a really good spot having four young guys who also have experience at the upper levels that they could turn to. Max Freed, do you think that Max Freed can elevate his game one more level? He was awesome in the second half last year when he came back from his injury. Can, can this go? guy be a Cy Young type pitcher? Let me pull up his his numbers here. Um, so in the second half, ninety three innings, a one seven four ERA. Um a 190 average against um let me find where's the advanced here we go uh a 274 fip a 0.85 whip and a 237 babbit that is stellar i he's definitely got the talent to do that does he have the talent to do that for a full 150 innings? I don't know. Um, he's obviously never done it. Now, he's a really good pitcher. A really good pitcher. He's shown flashes here and there over the last couple of years of being a potential ace number two guy. I don't know if I would necessarily say... No, yeah, I would say Cy Young. Cy Young contender. I could see that. I mean, yeah. If he puts up the the second half line over a full season, that's a Cy Young right there. No question well, about it. Because I guess even looking at his season or like whole season numbers, 165 good, yeah. innings, uh, 304 ERA to 331 FIP with uh, oh shoot, uh, an 858 K per nine. Two two three walks per nine. That equates to twenty three point seven percent strikeout rate, six percent walk rate. 
his his average was pretty legit. There wasn't a whole lot of Babbit luck there. Yeah, I I think that's real. Now, yeah. real and sustained are two different questions, though, and I think that's where we're getting. He's not really with, been a huge injury risk in the past couple of years, right? He's had. Yeah, I mean, he's been relatively healthy. He pitched 165 in 2019, again, 165 this past year. So it seems like this is exactly the time where he should be taking that next step and become like a 180 inning pitcher guy. Yeah, plus he's 28. So he's finally fully grown into his body. I think he's figured out pitching in the majors um, from both a mental and physical standpoint. So, and it, not having Mike Soroka, you need him to take that another another step. Because it looks like Mike Soroka is targeting middle of the season to come back. Now, that's what his camp is saying. I have no idea what the Braves are saying. Yeah, and that whole rehab situation has not been going well at all because he's had multiple kind of setbacks and multiple surgeries on the Achilles. And that's obviously not a uh, small injury, so... No. Hopefully Sirocco gets back, but I don't think the Braves are really like counting on him for much this year, I don't think. Yeah, it's one of those where it's almost like... Uh, I'm trying to think of another time that that's happened, I guess, in, in the big leagues to compare it to, but uh, my best comp is almost is, is football. Um, here this last year, Cam Akers went down with an Achilles... Or, no, uh, yeah, an Achilles tear, yeah. actually, in July. Came back for the postseason... If they get uh, Soroka for any uh, significant segment of this season, be it a month, two months, that's just adding more depth to this team that is already swimming in in starting pitching right now. So, yeah. but yeah, it'd be it'd be like a bonus. It, it's yeah. not like something. It's, that's it's expected, a nice to but have if, if they get it. Like it's um, great. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice to have. They're not expecting it, but if they get it, they'll be hyped. Um, I guess any other things on the Braves you want to mention, uh, hitters or pitchers or just the team in general? No, I don't think so. Uh, I guess the, the, maybe the one other thing is cat catcher this year. They're pretty locked down, right? It, it's, it's Darno and then William Contreras for the 65 games that Darno doesn't play. They also brought in, uh, Manny Pena to be the backup Ooh, there. Right. Manny so, Pineapple. I forgot about him. So does yeah, William so, Contreras even have a spot on the team now? Eh, maybe not. Because Manny Pena is a really good, like, I, I wouldn't even call him a backup. I just call him like a alternate catcher. Like yeah, he's a, he's, he's, he's a 70 fine. game a year guy. But you know, someone's getting hurt there. Like, you know, Darno is probably going to get hurt. Like he always does. Yeah. So you got to have so, that catching depth and, I'm sure William Contreras will be up at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, moving on to the Marlins, who, uh, what was their biggest loss of the, the off season? Derek Jeter. Yeah. Yeah. I think Derek Jeter, that, uh, might be their only loss of the off season. Uh, no, actually their biggest loss of the off season. Um, there's two that I think are equal. One kills you and the other kills me. Monty and uh, Lewis and Brinson. Lewis. Yep. Monty yeah. Harrison and Lewis Brinson. Those are the two biggest losses of this team. And I don't know that I can support the Marlins from here on out. Uh, Lewis Brinson is in spring training with the Astros. So maybe he'll make the team. <laughs> Lewis, Chaz McCormick and uh, 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 Jake. Um, Myers. Yeah, and Jake Myers are all going to be rotating center field. Yeah, and there's uh, Jose Siri as well. Oh, God. Okay, we've they... just gone on a Astros tangent here. Sorry. No, <laughs> Brinson, I, uh... I went on a Lewis Brinson tangent. Thank you very much. True, yeah. Uh, but no, this uh, this Marlins team, um, a team that was way better than expectations in 2020, the shortened season. 2021... I think people had hope that maybe they would continue that that um, kind of before we expected success, and they didn't. Um, they kind of fell flat on their face, um, and I don't really 
like there wasn't really a whole lot of changeover in the the roster between those two years. Um, they yeah, lo- that's true. They, they lost really six to much. They lost six to an injury, and that's about yeah. it. Um, so coming into this year, I guess we shouldn't have very high expectations if they stay the same, right? Well, they yeah. basically stayed the same. They brought in Avisail Garcia and Jorge Soler, both big, really good moves if you're trying to compete. And then they traded for Joey Wendell from the Rays, who Wendell kind of lost his spot when he got hurt maybe two and a half years ago and never really got his starting role at third base back for the Rays because they just have oodles of cheap guys that managed to be really good. Um, but those are really the only three moves that they made, uh, at least on the, the hitting side. Um, and I really like it from a power standpoint with uh, Soler and Avi. And but I don't think it's really going to be enough like to take them from being bottom of the division to being competitive. I think it's just going to make them interesting to watch. Yeah, it's like a weird kind of lineup because, yeah, like you said, the the two moves bring in uh, Garcia and Soler. They're really nice moves. They're good players and they help the lineup a ton. But I feel like they're missing some star power here. Like they just don't have that guy now in the lineup. What I will say, to their credit, they do have a couple of really young guys that are their guys. Um sort of. Uh maybe not drafted by them, but or signed by them originally, but their guys. And Jazz Chisholm. Um some really young outfielders and like Jesus Sanchez uh, that could be really good. And I think jazz Chisholm is probably that guy that's on the cusp of being, if not a superstar, like the one step down from that. What would that be? He is a very, very exciting player. Yeah. He's got basically the, the total package he's got, you know, to go along with the personality, which obviously everyone knows he has, but he's super fast likes to steal bases, plays great defense, got crazy power. I mean, he's got it all, basically. He just has to put it together for more of the season than he did last year. Last year, he started really hot. Then he kind of just faded through the the rest of the season. And, I mean, it was his first time getting, like, playing time through an entire season. So I think if he can make the adjustments, he could be huge for this team. Yeah. And... But then outside of Jazz and and um, Jesus Sanchez, they really don't have a whole lot else on that that lineup that you get excited about. Like Garrett Cooper is an underrated player, but Jesus Aguilar, he's got power. He's been solid for most of his career. He's not an incredible talent. Like he's not a guy that's going to elevate your team. Um, Brian Anderson, as we talked about a couple, maybe a week or two weeks ago, is like the most boring player in Major League Baseball. (laughs) He's average build, average face, average name, average player. Yes. Nothing stands out about him. Like that's not a bad thing. It's just not a good thing either. Um, and then you got Miggy Rojas, who is a fun guy. Love Miggy Rojas's personality. Great leader. Great leader. Yeah. I honestly think Miggy Rojas would do just as much for this team as the managers he would the shortstop. They, well, they've had him uh, manage those games at the end of the year. Yeah. So he he could be the player manager, man. Uh, he really who could. Needs, uh, and, and honestly, betting, Donnie right? Baseball, I think, is probably on his way out after the season. What's the point of what he's been doing if he's just rebuilding the team and he's going to leave now? Like, Well, I don't think he's going to choose to leave. I think they're going to fire him. I thought they extended him. D- well, Jeter's gone now. You got to remember that. So it's yeah. Bruce Sherman and whoever he brings in to, to basically run everything. So at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a change of heart and they decide to cut him loose. Yeah, I don't really, I'm a bit confused about the direction. Uh, just like in the division they play in, 
they need to be making more moves if they want to compete with the other teams. Yeah, because we haven't like, really talked about their pitching yet, but oh, now it, 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 let's do that because I think that's where they actually do have a leg up on. Honestly, in my opinion, a leg up on most of the division. Yeah, this is so. This rotation is no doubt about it. One of the probably top ten rotations. Maybe you could make the argument that they're top five rotation in the league right now. Uh, behind Sandy Alcantara, Pablo Lopez, Trevor Rogers, who was a rookie last year, Eliezer Hernandez, and then recently added last season in the trade deadline, Jesus Lazardo, who was apparently throwing 98 in his uh, spring training outing, topping out at 100. So I don't know if that means he's uh, fixed, but that's pretty exciting. I would like to think that means that the Jesus Lizard is fixed. Um. I really want him to be good. I want him to be yeah. good so bad. And like with with the Marlins track record with all these pitchers, all these pitchers are so young that every single pitcher in that rotation that I just named is under the age of 27. And the Marlins have made them all better as they have got more experience in the big leagues. Well, and they so, have, and they have two more starters. That, at least two more. Yeah. That don't really have a spot slash one's injured. Um, but they're both major league ready. Uh, I think they both played in the majors and Sixto Sanchez and Edward Cabrera. And those guys are amazing young pitchers. Um, like we talked, uh, in our, a, a couple different episodes, actually in, in the best, uh, seasons or the best single seasons under the age of 25. Um, and the, um, the hall of faves episode that we did, uh, and Jose Fernandez and like, none of these guys are necessarily him, but there's a lot of, a lot of these guys remind me a lot of Jose Fernandez. I don't know if they're quite that echelon, but, but they're like right below. They're all really good pitchers. And that gives a lot of hope for this Marlins team. Now their bullpen. I don't think it's quite as good. Is it? Uh, they got a couple guys that are interesting in there. Um, Anthony Bender is pretty good. Dylan Floro is kind of a veteran. He's been pretty decent in the past. Like they've got some names in there, but like I don't know them all like super well. Yeah. Oh, it looks like Edward Cabrera is projected to be in the bullpen. Yeah, I guess someone's got to so. start there. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see because. I, I think he's a he's a flamethrower, isn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. So just like I, most of these guys, I I wonder if they're going to end up trying to use uh, Edward Cabrera as a closer at some point. It's possible, but I feel like he's still got so much potential as a starter. They've got to get through that possibility first. That's true. So maybe use him as the long relief guy to keep him stretched out a little bit. Yeah. That's fair. And Plus, he's still going to throw 98 as a long reliever. It's not like it's... <laughs> Probably, yeah. A couple other... You just made me think of something else, though. So, they also have Max Meyer, who was their first-round pick from a couple years ago. I don't remember what... Was that, 19? Uh, it was, I think, 20, right? I think it was 19. But, uh... I thought it was the, the 2020 number four overall pick. Uh, 2020 number three overall. Okay, so 2020, so this guy came out of college, and he seems like he's already really close to the majors because he got to AAA last year. Um, he's another guy that they've been using exclusively as a starter, but people have always had concerns whether he's going to be able to stick as a starter because he's mostly just a two-pitch guy. Um, but he would be incredible out of the bullpen pretty much right away because But he also, I would so like hard. to point out with two-pitch guys, I've been very anti Waskari Noah for a while because of that, and he's doing fine. Huh, yeah. So, Max Myers are good enough. Right? Max Myers probably okay. Uh, yeah. Well, but yeah, he's, maybe just a... he is the the um, baseball's nineteenth overall prospect, the number one in the Marlins organization, and pretty much everyone does project him to be on this team at some point this year. So, yeah. So. If the other guys are pitching well, then 
it's going to be hard to displace any of them out of that rotation. Maybe he makes his first impact at the major league level in the bullpen, and then they see in the in a future season to move him back to the rotation, kind yeah. of like uh, Kopech it, it, style. Essentially, exactly what Edward Cabrera is doing. Edward Cabrera started at the end of last year. He never did pitched he? out of the bullpen. Yeah, I, I he thought did. he pitched out of the bullpen. I th- I thought that he if he pitched out of, out of the rotation, it was due to injury. He started last year at the end of the year. Gotcha. But I think overall, basically what we're saying is we're very excited about um, Marlins pitching and pitching development and everything. They've clearly done a really good job with it. Now they just need to match the offense side of it. Yeah, and, and Avi Soler and Joey Wendell are a step in the right direction. Yeah. It's just not enough to compete with the other teams in this division. I think there's one team that we can argue here a little bit later that they may have vaulted themselves above, but they could justifiably still be the bottom of the division just because they don't have enough power. Like it's a pitcher friendly park. So unless they had a lot of pop, they're not going to be getting a lot of home runs at home. So. Eh. Yeah. I had another thought too, but I completely forgot what it was. Okay, we'll circle back if we need to, but we'll go on to the Mets now. Yes. The Mets uh, made a ton of moves this offseason. Uh, Uncle Steve Cohen's uh, pocketbook is, uh, you know, doing work this offseason. Bring in Max Scherzer on a mega deal for three years. Uh, they traded for Chris Bassett re- recently. Uh, then pre-lockout, they added Starling Marte, Mark Canha and Eduardo Escobar. So all really nice veteran signings going to be uh, starters on this team. And then their starting rotation is looking fantastic, especially since Jacob De- DeGrom appears to be healthy. So you got DeGrom, Scherzer, 1-2, backed up by Bassett, then Carrasco, and then Tyler McGill. Like That's a great rotation. It is. Now, there's a lot of... Uh, well, I don't know if there's a lot of concerns... I have a lot of concerns about Cookie making more than about, I don't know, 10 starts. Yeah. Like, he gets hurt a lot. And He did did apparently get uh, some sort of procedure done on his elbow. He said now he can finally, uh, like, fully extend his arm because before it was – he couldn't even do that. It was, like, in so much pain. He said his arm's feeling great now, and he's actually able to throw all his pitches. So hopefully that means he's actually healthy. Yeah, and they are down both uh, Joey Lucchesi and I don't know how long Tawan Walker's out, but he did have knee surgery over the offseason. So yeah, like, I think he'll be back sometime pretty early in the season. Gotcha, because yeah, because that's kind of their, their starter's depth. So like if Cookie goes down, they kind of need Tawan Walker or they they're kind of screwed. And Tyler uh, Miguel is not exactly a guy that I'd be excited about, but is it number five? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about him. It, but uh, are you? I don't know if I, I don't know if everyone is, but I think he's got a lot of potential, and he should get the first chance at it with uh, with Walker being injured to start the season. Well, you also are our uh, fantasy baseball like guru, so like you know a lot of these younger guys or these uh, lower on the depth chart guys that most people don't. Yeah. I guess that's true. Like the the numbers from last year when he did pitch, they don't like jump off the page, but um he just he's a guy that uh you know throws a lot of strikes and you know still struck out a lot of guys when he did pitch last season. So I think I think there's something there. Good deal. So so we like their rotation. What do we think about their lineup? So according to Fangraph's roster resource, the, the lineup is currently projected to look like Nemo, Marte, Lindor, uh, Pete, uh, Robbie Cano, who is back from his seemingly like 800th PED suspension of his career, um, Eduardo Escobar, McNeil, Canna, James McCann. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a good lineup overall with the... They've got three guys that they've added. Um, well, I guess four if you count Cano being re-added. Uh, it's overall 
it do, they do a lot of things well. They get on base a lot. They've got the power with guys like uh, Alonzo and um, Escobar. And then, I don't know, it's just like, it's just solid one through nine, basically. Yeah, and I, I do like that there's a DH now, so McCann is your number nine hitter. Because uh, McCann is not a good hitter. <laughs> no, he's not. he's not great. Uh, how about Lindor? Do you think Lindor can ever get back to his uh, amazing Cleveland performance yes. days? Yes, yes, I do. I, I hey. think it's I think it's a dumb question that people are so concerned. Like, if you think about it, most guys have a first year down season in their new homes. Like Nolan Arenado had one in St. Louis. He had his in in New York, obviously. Um, you had Javi that came in and was hit or miss for the half season that he was in, in New York. He was um, awesome. Actually, he was fantastic with the Mets. Well, I thought that was for like a three or four week period. And then he was like really swing and miss, which I mean, is I his think usual it, was, it was the other, it was the other way around. It was like the very beginning he struggled and then he was just incredible the rest of the way. Well, I guess if it's the other way around, it kind of supports my point. A that, little that less so because it was like, such a short thing. Yeah, but I don't know. I I always give a gap year personally before I start judging anyone. Um, no, I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. But we've seen it. There's countless other examples of first year big money free agents like struggling in a new environment. It just makes a ton of sense. Yeah, and and I do the same thing with like uh, like with um. Oh, no. Sorry, I just got a Purdue update. How are they doing? Uh, Purdue's winning by one with four minutes left. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. St. Peter's time. Um, but, like, Stan, when he came over to New York, like, his power never left, obviously, but, like, he was getting, he got hurt and all that, and so, like, he didn't really play as much the first year, and then, now he's kind of settled in and he's got his role. And I think he's, he was a bit healthier last year. And so I, I kind of think the whole narrative that um, Lindor, uh, that trade and then that signing was a bust. I think that's just complete poppycock. Like give him a year. I think he'll be good. He's still an elite defender. He's still a big on base guy. He's fast. Like, I I believe in in Francisco Lindor. Yeah, and it's not like he's old either. Like, there's no reason that no, he's 28. He, he's right in his prime. Like, he should be having great years for a few years now. So, now if you were yeah. to ask me the same question about Robbie Cano, hey, the last time we saw Robbie Cano playing Major League Baseball games, he was quite good. Yes, so. but but counterpoint. When is the last time we saw Robbie Cano playing Major League Baseball games? Uh, two years ago. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a long time. Yeah, he is. He is definitely getting up there in age. He's thirty nine years old this season. Uh, yeah, I don't really know what to expect from him, and and I think he's signed for two more years actually. So, uh, he is. As soon as it loads, signed through twenty twenty three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, he does not have an option. So, twenty twenty three. The other thing I'll point out about the Mets is that they're they've got a way better bench situation than they did last year. Last year they ran into all those injury issues. And they were playing the Janeshwi Farguses and the Flimbo Jacksons of the world in their lineup. Only one of those uh, names is real. But, but that was <laughs> that was before Janeshwi. Uh, was on the Cubs and like yeah. a superstar, right? Yeah, of yeah. course. But uh, this year they've got guys like J.D. Davis, Dom Smith, who started most of the last year in the outfield, and then Luis Guillorme, a guy who can back up shortstop. So I don't know. Like I feel like this team's a bit better equipped and than they were to run into the injuries again. Don't don't leave out my guy, Tomas Nito. <laughs> Jeez. I usually don't mention the backup catcher, but 
but Tomas I guess we're Nito, talking backup catcher. Yeah, he's Tomas great. Nito. I, honestly, Tomas Nito is probably a better hitter than James McCann. I kind of wish he were the starter. <laughs> Um, finally, their bullpen, which they added to this offseason with Adam Ottavino coming over from Boston. Um, it was already a pretty solid bullpen with Edwin Diaz and Trevor May, Seth Lugo. Uh, so I think it just gets a bit stronger and, you know, like I got no issues with this group at all. Yeah, I'm definitely intrigued to see how the Chase and Shreve pickup works works out because like Jason Shreve has been he's been around he uh he came up with the uh the Braves was there for a year pitched for the Yankees for a while um traded to the Cardinals with Giovanni Gallegos for Luke Boyd got DFA'd by the Cardinals because he was not good um the Mets actually did pick him up in 2020 and they decided to bring him back this year after he spent a year with the Pirates so I'm interested to see how that goes so, yeah, he would be their one lefty in the bullpen, so if they need that. Yeah. So how does uh, the loss of um, still pending free agent Michael Conforto, how does that play into this Mets outlook? Because uh, to me, it kind of looks like it opens up, like it opens up some more opportunities for this team. Like he's a great player. Don't get me wrong. Like you would probably be better off having Michael Conforto than losing him. But at the same time, I think it almost opens up some more uh, options for what you could do with this lineup. Like you could use your bench a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true, but I wonder if uh, there's any chance that Conforto could come back to this team now that it's like so late uh, in the the spring training season. Like he would kind of fit on on this team though, just on a one year deal. And uh, they, they kind of need uh Another outfielder, I would say. Yeah, that's true. I guess it kind of depends on if you consider J.D. Davis or Dom Smith an outfielder. You can consider them that. They're really not that, though. So, bringing in uh, Conforto and then uh, sending Luis Guillerme or Guillerme some somewhere down, out, I don't know. He still has one option, so you could send him down. Um, and then Conforto play left and Canna becomes a bench guy. Yeah, I think, you know, limiting Canna, some of his playing time would be good because he kind of struggles against right handed pitchers. So he he's like the perfect partner with some other left handed outfielder like Conforto. Well, or Nemo even. Yeah. Like cause Yeah, even Nemo. Because Marte you could still throw in center. I mean, even at even it is 33 years old is not old at all, but like I would still uh, be comfortable throwing Marte out there and center on a day that you want Canada to go out and play right or have Conforto play right. And Canada plays left. I don't know. Yeah. Got a yeah, lot of they, options there. They can mix and match with that for sure. So actually, I, I really I think do... they should trade. Uh, they should try to trade Dom Smith. Cause I don't, I don't see the clearest path for him to actually get a lot of playing time right now yeah unless he's the one that splits with canha but i don't know what they're gonna do i would love to see a full season of dom smith yeah Uh, he's so good he just you need to not put him in left field one that's just bad in general we'll get to why i think that's bad when we talk about the phillies um but like i want to see dom smith hit for 500 plate appearances as a first baseman or DH. That's all I ask. Send him somewhere yeah. like send him to Colorado. <laughs> maybe they can get uh, to Colorado. Yeah. Maybe they could get CJ Crone back. Well, they don't need CJ Crone because they have Pete. Um, I guess they can't get Rymel Tapia now, can they? No. Garrett Hampson. There you go. Okay. If they want to downgrade significantly, sure. Yeah. That's what I would do if I were them. Yeah. That would be an old old Mets thing to do. But yes, it would. They're a bit smarter now. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know if they're smarter. They just have more money. 
Well, they're they're operated by different people. That's true. Okay, so uh, anything else on the Mets? Just to close out on them, we can go on to the Phillies. If not, I think I'm going to hold my remaining thoughts for the end. Whenever we're talking about how we think the division's going to stack up. Okay, sure. So Phillies making some big splashes in free agency. Very Dombrowski uh, moves here, going for the big bats. So they brought in Kyle Schwarber on a four-year four deal to play left field. And then they brought in Nick Castellanos to DH and also play the outfield on a five-year deal for $100 million. So they've uh, decided that this is the time that they're going to go over the luxury tax. Um, and those were really the big two moves to add to already what was a pretty formidable lineup lineup now is looking like probably a top three lineup in the league would you say yeah I'd, i think i would be pretty comfortable saying that i mean it's it, we were talking about this before the the uh podcast started tonight but schwarber is your leadoff guy followed by castellanos bryce jt real Muto, reese hoskins and gene segura is your one through six how amazing does that sound that does sound amazing. And all these guys are like right in their primes, really, other than maybe Segura. But like all these guys are 29 to 31 years old. So they but, should absolutely. But like, even a past prime it. Segura is a really good second baseman, like above average second baseman. Like I love. Yeah, yeah. Guy. He's perfectly fine. Yeah. But the other guys are, you know, stud hitters with crazy amounts of power. Yeah. Like they all hit what? Like. 30 plus home runs last year. I don't even know, but uh, uh, yeah. So Schwarber, I guess other than real Muto, it was, yeah. I was going to say, these and guys Hopkins are going to be time, insane. Could we, else, like, could we see 150 home runs from the top five in the lineup of the Phillies? Ooh, I think so, man. It's possible. JT might be the weak link and he's, he's not, not really a weak link for a catcher. Yeah. Like if Reese Hoskins can make a little bit more contact, you're looking at like a 40 home run guy there. Bryce is a 40 home run guy at like kind of an average season. Um, Schwarber, if he plays every if day, he's healthy, he should easily hit 40 home runs in that ballpark. Castellanos, same thing. Like, oh, we we need to we need to actually keep track of this throughout the season. Just home runs from the top five of the lineup for the Phillies. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Uh, write that down so we don't forget. Okay. Um, um, but yeah, so but, I guess with the lineup for the Phillies, where I start to have a lot of questions, um, well, I guess there's one spot where I have questions. There's uh, one spot where I know the answer, uh, and then I don't know who Matt Veerling is, so I'm not going to speak on him. Uh, I have questions on Alec Bohm. I, I'm personally an Alec Bohm believer. I think he's going to break out. I think he's going to be really good. Um, he he was really good in 2020. He sucked in 2021. He's only 25. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. Let's give him another year. This is the year that he becomes a, um, not an elite hitter, at least not yet, if he's going to become one. This year, he's going to be a really good hitter. Um uh, kind of in the in the way that Dylan Carlson was last year for the full season, uh, about 256, some power, whatever. Um, but then where I think the Phillies really need to make a move is at shortstop. 32-year-old Didi Gregorius was really good for a really long time. He is no longer a serviceable Major League shortstop, in my opinion. Thoughts? Yeah, what do they I'll throw do? in a I'll throw in a uh, stat because we are I think we're transitioning into the elephant in the room situation with the the defense of this ball club. Yep. So DD um, from 2016 through 2021 in the outs above average um, total, he was last of all the qualified guys, 259th on the list with negative 72 outs above average. So worst defender in baseball by that measure. Um, Nick Castellanos was 258, so one spot ahead of him with 
negative 56 run outs above average. And then Kyle Schorber was minus 39, which is 253rd on the list. So, uh, brutal, brutal, uh, three defenders. I mean, Castellanos and Schorber should never be on the field at the same time with the DH in place, but still like, I mean, there's a lot of questions here. So, uh, I'm going to throw this out here and I'm going to um, reiterate something that I've said for weeks. Uh, I'm a big believer in Kyle Schwarber as an underrated defender. That being said, he's still bad. Um, I don't. Great arm. That's true. Great arm. Uh, it's the whole tracking and catching the ball thing that kind of is his downfall. Um He's made some spectacular diving catches when he was with the Cubs. I'll give him that. Uh, but I'm not sure I would ever want Kyle Schwarber and Nick Castellanos like in the same lineup because it means one of them is going to be on the field. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a very bold strategy by John Browski. I mean, he's obviously not scared to do anything, really, but he basically committed... One hundred and seventy nine million dollars to two DHs. Like who does that? Now, this is kind of a league where. If you can limit. The other team from scoring by having just elite pitching. And then you can go out. And destroy the other team's pitchers. You can make as many errors as you want. and You're going to win. And this is a very Dave Dombrowski move. I would also point out. He kind of just goes and gets the firepower and then just he's not a very uh, in the weeds uh, kind of baseball fundamentals uh, type GM. He makes the splashy moves. He gets the guys that are going to make the biggest impact, even if that comes with some some downfalls. Um, he showed that with the Tigers back in the, the late 2000s. He showed that with the Red Sox. He's showing it here. Indeed, yeah. Can we talk about some other bad defenders they have on their, their ball club here? So they got Hoskins at first base, who's not good at all there. And then they got Alec Bohm, who's probably a future first baseman, because he does not seem like he can handle third base at all. And then we already talked about Gregorius. Um, and then Matt Veerling, who himself has not really played that much center field in his career. So, like, to put him between... Castellanos and Schwarber like that is not the spot you want to be okay hear me out if you were Dave Dombrowski would you give Shane Victorino a call <laughs> love it let's do it I'm a genius I am Flying the new Hawaiian. GM of the Phillies yes love it but yeah, no, I, I love this Phillies team. I am rooting for them so hardcore this year. Um, I want to see them break the home run record. I think it's very well within reach. Uh, the record that was set in like 2019 uh, by was the, who who ended up winning that race? Was it the Yankees it was or the, the Twins? I think the Twins set it originally and then the Yankees broke it. In the same season? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. But yeah, I, I do have questions about their defense. Their bench, to me, isn't great. Uh, Garrett Stubbs, their backup catcher. Uh, Johan Carmago. Oh my god. St. Peter's beat Purdue. Woo! -hoo. No! Go Peacocks. No! <laughs> oh my god. Um... Yeah, Johan or Johan Carmago, Adam Hazley, and Mickey Moniak. Who Mickey Moniak was the number one pick back in 2016. Incredibly high, uh, highly regarded prospect for a while. He's kind of fallen off. He's not really been too great the last couple of years. That's what their bench is stacking up like right now. So if you were Dombrowski, how do you fix the whole DD short and uh, really kind of? and bench situation yeah so the dd at short situation could be fixed by one of their top prospects if not if he's not their top prospect bryson stott who seems to be like really close to being ready um i know bryce harper is a huge advocate of his game and 
I think he's going to be in Dombrowski's ear asking for a very quick, uh, speedy promotion for Bryson Stott. Um, the center field issue, maybe maybe a guy like Adam Hazley could do it or Moniak. Like, those guys at least would give them a little bit better defense, I think, than Veerling. So that might be the route they go. They just sacrifice a little bit uh, of offense because they've got the mashers in there and, and just try to get someone to – be up the middle that can help them out there. It's actually a really good point. This is a team that is set up perfectly for your prototypical center fielder. Your fast, defensive first, really light hitting guy. Um I Roman e- Quinn was like the guy, honestly. I don't know why he's not on this team. I yeah, I don't know why they DFA'd him, honestly. But but he's the he's a perfect fit. He plays great defense, super fast. Like he cover a lot of ground there. Yeah, and and maybe their thinking was Mickey Moniak can do exactly that, even if he's a light hitting guy. Um, but that's kind of exactly what they need: a guy that can cover part of left, part of right. Because let's be real, Bryce is not as good of a defender now as he was in his MVP season. No, and he really wasn't not. great then, but he was he was decent. But I'm guessing three, four years from now, we're going to be wishing Bryce was in the DH spot. So get a guy in That's center that can That's make... the thing, man. These guys are all locked up long term. Imagine this team in about four years on Schwarber's last year of his deal. All these guys are going to be kind of like aging. Uh, it could potentially being very not pretty like the time is now for the Phillies they got to push all in which is obviously Dombrowski's only move that he knows uh, yep but they're they seem like they're still missing something and we haven't even talked about pitching yet so the question I'm going to ask you is does any of this defense like matter is their pitching good enough to hold up their end of the bargain I I would say yes I would say their their pitching is good enough and so this is a this is a pitching staff that is uh, headlined by a rotation of Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, Kyle Gibson, one, two, three. I don't think anyone would argue with having that one through three on their team. Is it the most elite? No, but I mean, not every team can have DeGrom and Scherzer one, two. Yeah. Um, and then Ranger Suarez, uh, who was a reliever for a while for the Phillies came into the the rotation last year after uh after being their closer last year. Yeah, weirdest career path ever. Yeah. And he was really really solid. Um and their their five spot is kind of up for grabs right now. I don't honestly know who's going to get it. I don't know who's in the running for it. But if you have Solid pitching four out of five days is your starter that can go six, seven, eight innings, which with Wheeler, you're there's a chance you have a complete game every five days with Wheeler. Like Nola is dominant. Kyle Gibson is really, really good. Um, not to mention they have guys down in the uh, uh, minors like Hans Kraus who was the uh, number one pitching prospect of the Rangers that came over in the pros- or in the trade with Kyle Gibson and Ian Kennedy last year. So at some point, he might come up. Um, and then you get to the bullpen. And this bullpen has, for years, been somewhere between really, really, really bad and downright awful. And I think they were like the worst bullpen in history, like one of those years, right? Yeah. And so I think what I said was the nice way to say it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like they have brought in uh, Brad Hand, Jerry's Familia, Corey Kniebel, Ryan yeah. Sheriff, Nick Nelson. They're getting Sir Anthony Dominguez back from injury. Like they've only got a handful of guys left over from last year. One of them being Jose Alvarado who they got at the trade deadline or no, sorry. That was uh December, 2020 trade, not trade deadline before the season. Um, but there's only a handful of guys here that were on that worst bullpen team. Yeah. And they brought in, like, like you said, these guys are pretty established. They've had a lot of success at the major league level. 
like Knievel um, as a closer, also Hand as a closer. Familia has had a pretty long career as well. Like these guys are, they kind of know what they're doing. They're not a bunch of like guys you've never heard of that are just going out there and giving up three runs every time they go out. Like I think Girardi's going to be way happier with uh, what he has to work with here because last year there was a definitely a lot of games where he would leave Wheeler and Nola in way too long, like because he just had no trust in what he was going to be able to put out there with the bullpen. Yeah. This year, I think he'll have something to, to work with. Yeah, basically last year, his only option after those guys was Ranger Suarez. But then once you move Suarez to the rotation, it's like, well, now you got nobody trade for yeah. Ian Kennedy and you're trying to throw the same guy out there every single day to throw two, three innings. So, but now and, he's got uh, options. Jose Alvarado, man, that guy's wild, man. Like he, he throws a hundred miles per hour from the left side, but he has no clue where the ball is going. So it's like a, it's a roller coaster to watch that man pitch. Yeah. But no, I, I uh, think moral of the story though, is this Phillies team gives a different impression going into 2022 than it did 2021 by a lot. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, now I before agree. we get into how that's going to impact the standings, we should probably talk about the nationals. Yep. Do we have to so, though? Yeah. Nationals are, they're interesting, but I'm not exactly sure what they're doing. Um, Mike Rizzo is kind of like Dombrowski where he doesn't really like to do the rebuilding thing and he's never really done it before. So this is kind of his first go around at it, but then he goes out and he, he signs Cesar Hernandez. He signs Nelson Cruz. So you look at the top four of the lineup, Hernandez, Juan Soto, Cruz, and then Josh Bell, you say, Oh, okay. This looks like a pretty solid lineup, but that's when the, that's when the good news ends. The bottom of this lineup is rough. It is a bunch of really unproven guys and really washed up guys. So I'm sorry. I mean, are you telling me Lane Thomas is not elite? <laughs> you sound like, uh, dare you, sir? Sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Just, yeah, like, Keeper Ruiz, Ruiz, pretty good prospect and everything, but we haven't seen him do what he is supposed to do yet. Then you and got I mean, Alcides Escobar, like as your shortstop. Come on. Yeah. And Michael Franco, who's been around pretty much every bad team that exists here in the last like three years. Yeah. Um, long time Orioles third baseman. Uh, went over to the Reds last year. He did? Uh, two years ago. Long time Phillies third baseman. Yeah. What am I saying? Who am I he said thinking? Orioles. Am I thinking he was, on the Orioles for, he was on the Orioles for one year, I think. This but. is going to be real awkward if I'm sitting here talking about Freddie Galvis. Freddie Galvis went to uh, Japan this year. I think I'm mixing the two. Because Freddie Galvis <laughs> was the longtime Phillies. Yeah. But so was, so was Franco. I don't know what I'm talking about, apparently. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, so lineup is going to be interesting at the top. What do you do with this team? Because their pitching is really bad, but they have Juan Soto. So it's like you can't really just tear everything down. You got to be doing something to get back into contention real quick. You only have Soto for a few years, potentially. So you you can't really tear it down for a couple reasons. One, Juan Soto. Two, Mike Rizzo's the GM. He's never going to do that. Um, so in your rotation, you do have Josiah Gray, who is or who was a really, really high or highly regarded prospect with the Dodgers. Uh, came over with Kaber and s uh, one or two other guys um, for Trey Turner and Max Scherzer. Um, he's a guy that I think is going to be really, really good. So this year is probably a learning year for him. But then in the minors, uh, Cade Cavalli, um, is going to be up soon. He, uh, he actually made the spring start today against the Cardinals and he was nasty. 
Um, so I would expect Cavalli to come up this year and be in the rotation. Um, but I don't know if, if I were Mike Rizzo, like you gotta be looking for a team that's not going to contend for a while that has a, uh, superstar available. And I know we talked about it on Wednesday, uh, with T-Rad and a guy that he wants on the, um, the Jays, but a guy that I think would be a really good building point for this team would be Cattell Marte. Yeah, but at that point, like, it's like that yeah. one guy is not going to do it. And also, how do they even make that happen? This team is, like has an awful farm system, right? Yeah, I mean, their top 10 isn't horrible. They've got some really good pieces there in Jackson, Routledge, Brady House, Kate Cavalli. Um, Kabert is technically still in the prospect list. Jeremy De La Rosa. Um, but then after that, it does get kind of bleh. Um, this pitching staff scares me. Like this is potentially like one of the worst rotations in the league. Corbin was terrible last year. He seems like he's completely lost everything that he used to have. I mean, maybe he'll get it back, but then you got like 35 year old Paolo Espino 29 year old Eric Fetty. These guys have never really done much in the majors. And then Anibal Sanchez, after a year off, he's 38. He's coming back. Like that, I don't know. I don't have any expectations for this team being good at all because how bad their pitching is. Yeah. And their, uh, their bullpen does not inspire any more confidence. They did bring back Sean Doolittle. They brought in Steve c -Sheck. Um Outside of those guys, like, I'm not thrilled by anybody. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not thrilled by those two. No, no, they're definitely over their, uh, their peak performance time in their career. Yeah. But, and... Yeah, and at some point, this team will get Joe Ross back. Uh, I Are they going to get Strasburg back at any point this year? Yeah, he's supposed to be like going to be coming back, I think, May. But he's always hurt, so we'll see if that actually holds. Yeah. And and yeah. then as far as their uh, their lineups concerned, Carter Keboom is uh, starting the season on the 60 day with a strained forearm. So he'll be back in a couple months. But Carter Keboom has not really shown that he can be the guy that they drafted 28th overall back in 2016 either. So. I don't know, this is this is probably the worst team that the Nationals have fielded since. I don't it's know. been a while. 20... Since their rebuilding days, right? Yeah, when was their rebuilding days? Like, when did before, that end? Right before they drafted uh, Strasburg and Harper. So, like, 20... 10? 2009, 2010, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is going to be rough if you're a Nationals fan. I'm not going to lie. Um, now, I wouldn't put it past Mike Rizzo to try and make a move, but I don't know what moves are available at this point. So I think for this season, he's kind of stuck. Um, yeah. I, I really thought the move that would like start to signal good things to come would be if they put out a big offer for a guy like Correa. They didn't. Um, and I think it's because they knew that down the pipeline, there wasn't really a whole lot there. But Yeah, so I think we both agree that Nationals are fifth place in this division pretty clearly. Yeah, I think so. So how do you that, see the rest of it shaking out? So I think the Marlins are going to be better than we expect just from the standpoint that their, their pitching staff is still fantastic and they did actually bring in some bats. Um, not enough bats and not good enough bats to make me think this is going to be a competitive team, but I think they'll be in the race for third place. I still think ultimately they come out in fourth. Um, now we get to the difficult part. Uh, and 
I have more belief in the Braves and the Phillies than I do in the lineup of the Mets. The pitching staff of the Mets, I'm here for. And if they could do what they did with DeGrom, where DeGrom gives up one run and you only have to score two to win a game, and they do that with both uh, DeGrom and Scherzer, then they'll prove me wrong pretty easy. But I don't know. I just I don't know how much I trust Cano. Um, and some of these other guys that they've brought in, um, is Escobar, Canna, are they going to continue to be as good as they were? I don't know. This Phillies team, I love the lineup or the top six of the lineup. I love the pitching now. So I kind of think I'm taking the Phillies to win the division, which is something that I haven't said in a very long time. And you're, uh, Atlanta Braves, who finished uh, the 2021 season with the, what was it, 88 and 73 record, I think they'll be close to first. Like, like it's not going to be a runaway by any means, but I think you're going to have two teams pushing 90, 92 wins. And then the Mets are going to come in pretty close. Like, this is going to be sort of what the AL East was last year, where you had three teams that were in the 90 win range that all could have realistically won it. Yeah. So, so I don't, yeah, I think we wouldn't be shocked with any uh, result, but I'm going to go a different way, different order than you. I think the Braves are going to win this division. I really like just their starting pitching depth. And I think that's going to be huge this season with, um, I don't know, like I'm just really paranoid about pitcher injuries and, they seem like the the one team in this division most equipped to be able to handle that. And then they've got a great lineup to go with it and great bullpen too. So just overall, I feel like they're the best team. Um, the Mets will finish second because of their starting pitching and hopefully DeGrom and Scherzer can get through it. Uh, if they do, yeah, I have no question in my mind that they're going to be at least second place. And then I'll say the Phillies will finish third because the defense is going to end up hurting them to the point where despite them having pretty good pitching, the, they're going to get screwed over just by their defense giving up way more uh, outs than they should be giving up. So, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what I see. Yeah, and and to be honest, the the top three here like could go in any order for me. So yeah, I could, I could see that. I this is definitely the best that this division has been in years, though. Can we both agree to that? Yeah, it's pretty good. So, I think that's that's the key going into the season. The NL East is going to be an incredibly intriguing um, race to watch, uh, at least early on, because I think last year we thought it was going to be better than it was, and then it. Kind of sucked, but and you've I, got uh Castellanos already out here talking uh trash about the Mets pitchers and saying like he's not worried about facing Scherzer and DeGrom, he's just worried about finding a cheesesteak. So someone's got to play the villain, and I think Castellanos is a perfect man for that job. Yeah, I mean, the dude still has a flip phone, <laughs> so and all Cardinals fans hate him, right. Yes, yes, we do. Reflexing on that poor pitcher. I mean, it was kind of uncalled for. It was, but it was awesome. It was uncalled for, and therefore <laughs> I will not call it awesome. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, that, that that's our uh, NL East preview. Um, we're going to be doing our next uh, episode on Monday where we talk about, what are we going to be talking about, AL West? Uh, I believe it is the AL West, yes. So AL West on, on Monday, NL West on Wednesday, our normal time um, for both of those, 7, uh, 8.30 Eastern time. And uh, then we're going to be doing a couple mini episodes on a couple teams that we need to revisit. And then uh, it'll be any, opening day. Do we have any teasers you know. on what those teams might be? Uh, there'll sense. be NL Central and AL Central teams. Plus your Boston Red Sox, because we totally did not talk about them very much on Wednesday. Yeah, so expect to see a lot of uh, episodes dropping, and uh, you'll see us here on Twitch as well. So thank you so much for joining us. 
um, today and you can uh, like our con content on uh, and, and subscribe and comment on YouTube and your podcasting platforms and uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter at Getaway Day Pod. Thank you for listening. Talk to you soon. Yep. See you next time.